Hi and welcome to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Lovely to have you back. I hope that you've been watching my other episodes. So if this is your first time here, make sure you go back and watch all those because there's quite a few now. Also, just want to say I absolutely love the amount of interaction that I get off you guys. It's so nice reading your comments. I actually read them and enjoy replying to them. So thank you. I love the crime comms community. It's like you communicate so effectively and tell me so many different things that I was unaware of. And have also given me loads of ideas about what I'm going to do next. So thank you. I'm going to be covering lots of crimes that maybe aren't that well known, although I can't help but wanting to cover these big ones like Bobby Joe Long, which I'm doing today. They are just too tantalizing to me to ignore. I know they've probably been done to death elsewhere, but I still think I can add some value to it. So bear with if you've seen 403 documentaries on Bobby Joe Long. I still promise you there'll be something in here that you didn't know. So what formed the killer. Well, first of all, he's born 14th of October, 1953, in a place called Canova, which is in West Virginia. He's got his parents, Joe and Luetta Long, so he's another one who's given a name related to his father. They do that a lot, don't they, in the States? He was actually born with an extra chromosome, so he's got this chromosome called 46XXY. Now, a lot of people know that as moves, basically. It's where your puberty, as a male, encourages breast growth. So, for young men, that's just devastating, isn't it? I mean, that's the last thing that a young guy growing up wants is to suddenly find himself with moves, and it caused him to be really teased. He was hugely self-conscious as a child. In fact, his first wife, his ex-wife, said that when they went swimming, he wouldn't allow himself to be seen without a T-shirt. So he was clearly very concerned about the way that this impacted on him mental health wise and he actually got reconstructive surgery in the end so that's how severe it was so as a young man we know that that would have had an impact and all the way through being a teenager one of the other things that massively stands out with bobby is his mother one of the things that is contentious and i am the first person to say that i have boys i love my children they're an extension of me I'm not going to judge a mother who occasionally sleeps in the same bed as their child. You know, when my kids have been ill, that's something I've done. But Long actually slept in his mother's bed until the age of 14. Now, I know no matter how old your child is, they are your baby. But sharing a bed every single night with your mother, it's not what we would consider developmentally normal. And also... It's confusing, particularly for a young boy going through things like adolescence, because it's a time where we actually see a lot of young people withdraw from parents, starting the journey, essentially, of becoming more independent. In 1955, another really pivotal moment happens for Long. His parents split up, and he goes and lives with his mother in Miami, in Florida. And I hate to say that there is this linearity to a lot of serial killers experience but long had so many head injuries i mean serious head injuries so one when he was five he was knocked off a swing knocked unconscious another time his eyelid was skewered by a stick he fell off a bike lost loads of his teeth he was even as a child knocked down by a vw van he was actually unconscious during quite a few of those that's a lot of head trauma now we can't absolutely state that Long's head injuries changed the way that he behaved at this point. But we can see from a lot of research that frontal lobe damage definitely has an impact on impulse control. And when you've got poor impulse control, then you're far more likely to get involved in behaviours that are not acceptable. Now to add confusion to the mix, his parents start dating again. So they split up and they get back again and in 1958, they start connecting again. So Bobby's going to be relieved, but also confused. It's hard when you're a young person going through the flip-flops of those kind of marital issues because you base a lot of your security on your relationship with your parents. And to have that removed and taken away is really traumatic. But then when they get back together, suddenly you're hopeful, but you're also aware that it could be dashed at any moment, meaning that you can feel really insecure and children don't like feeling insecure attachment's really powerful 
when we feel that we're in a safe place with our primary caregivers, we just automatically feel more free to enjoy our world. When children are anxious or worried or fearful of their foundations, the consequence can be that they struggle forming relationships because they can't really trust them. Now Long doesn't find academia that simple. He struggles with first grade, he fails it, he has to start it again. And again, there's lots of disruption in his life at this point. He's moved back to West Virginia so that his mother can be with his father. So we've had a huge amount of displacement and confusion and breakups and head injuries. And in 1960 or 61, he actually falls from a horse and has another bad concussion. So we're seeing this constant issue with Long being clumsy to some degree. I mean, I've got to say, this guy hits his head more than I've had hot dinners as a kid. But childhood was very different back then. There was a lot more risk. Kids took healthy risks often and fell often. So it was more normal that children would receive injuries. In fact, we see that because children don't die that often anymore. You know, we protect them, we wrap them in cotton wool. But in the 60s, it was more common for children to have bad accidents because they were basically playing in dangerous areas like building sites or using spears to play with, that kind of stuff. Now, in 1963, again, Long is hit with the end of his parents' marriage. This is the second time, it's the final time. But the point is, he's probably started to build his foundation and then his mum and dad are split up again. She moves back to Florida and we see some real problems start to unfold as far as he and his relationship with his mother is concerned. She starts working as a waitress and one of the things that he notices is that she starts to dress in really sexy clothing, she starts dating multiple men and she transitions from being that mother, that carer, to being somebody that he doesn't necessarily recognise. And seeing your mother suddenly involved in multiple relationships with strangers is going to make you feel like your life is disintegrating in so many ways. You know, your parents are on and off, and then they have this final breakdown, and even though this is a pivotal moment in your childhood, all of the things that you knew as security are shattered, and suddenly your mum is going out every hour, bringing back men that you don't know, and making your world just feel really unsafe. You know, so imagine being so confused, but then add to this, your mother suddenly transforming before your eyes, going from your primary caregiver to working as a waitress and starting to evolve into this really different mother, one that you really don't recognise, one that you used to be close to but no longer feel that connection with. And Long does not like who she's becoming because she's dressing in sexy clothes, she's having flings with lots of different men. And no matter who you are as a child, the one thing that you want is to be able to look to your mother and feel that she adores you, you're safe, you're secure, that the world that you inhabit feels the same today as it did yesterday. No child wants the disorder and confusion. They like consistency. So for long, this would have probably caused a whole heap of issues, including, and I think it's really important to say this, including rage. Because as a child, you don't really have an opportunity to express yourself as you would when you are grown and you are conscious and you are able to emotionally communicate. But as a child, you are limited in that control. So to some degree, you internalize it. You start to become rageful within. You may not express it. Particularly when your life feels very vulnerable and you're worried that your primary caregivers might leave you, you're not going to express it. But you are going to feel it. And is this the point where Long starts to feel resentment towards women? Resentment to the way that certain women dress, the way that certain women act? Does he start to see sex as a weaponized experience? His mother's bringing back these men, and whilst that's completely innocent of her, she's not to blame, is this where it starts to trip into darker thinking? Around this time, just to bring this into sharp focus, he shot their family dog in the vagina. He killed it. That's shocking, right? That's the family dog. And the reason that he did that, according to Long, is that he resented his mother feeding the dog fillet manure when he was fed hamburger. I mean, what's going on in his head at that moment? I mean, the dog didn't go out and shop for the steak, did he? The dog wasn't in any control there. The dog's just this loyal resident in the family home. But the action of Long's mother feeding that dog 
something that he felt the dog didn't deserve in comparison to his own food, that caused him to wish to execute it. This innocent being. And it also, again, amplifies that idea that there is something growing in Long's consciousness around the expectation he has of women, the letdown that he feels from his mother, and the way that he even sees food as weaponized regarding it being a position of love. I love the dog more than I love you, because that's how he's interpreting it. But also note how he kills the dog. You, know, you could shoot the dog in the head, couldn't you? If you're gonna kill it, you're gonna execute it. But shooting the dog through its private parts is gonna cause absolutely catastrophic injury, but it's also sexually motivated, isn't it? And also it's female. It's the female area, it's just destroying the womb of the animal. So to me, that's really chilling because he's specifically going for the sexual region that he associates with birth, with procreation, with sex. What is he saying about the way he feels towards women? What is he saying about the power that he gives to that area of the anatomy and the willing destruction of that anatomy? Now in 1966, Long actually meets his future wife, Cynthia, and they start dating. And Cynthia was a really lovely woman, a really doting woman. She'd been really good friends with Long for a long period of time. He was involved at this point in petty crime. You know, he'd been accused of stealing a car with a friend, and in the 1970s, he's arrested for having stolen property when he's about 17. So we know that he's involved in petty crime. We know that he's been involved in killing animals. We know that he's involved in, shall we say, some negative behaviors at this point. And he drops out of school as well at this point. He's struggling. He does 10th grade twice, in fact, because he can't complete it. And it's also around this time he starts to grow away from his mother and he begins actually getting violent towards her. And that's an important change in his behavior because we're seeing an escalation in quite a few things, petty crime, animal abuse, and domestic abuse. So he's really cutting his teeth regarding becoming a predator, and of course, as we know, a serial killer. In 1971, we hear that Long is accused of raping a girl. However, as is the case in so many cases, even today, the police can't find the evidence enough to charge him, but we've got this first accusation of rape. Now, I don't know whether this rape charge is a reason that he decides to go into the army. Maybe it is. Maybe he realizes that he's starting to lose discipline, he's starting to unravel, and he imagines that going in the army is something that's gonna help him. Obviously, it's a career. It also means that he earns his GED, which he hadn't managed to do during his school experience. But for whatever reason, he goes in and he gets on with the job. In 1974, Bobby and Cynthia get married. And several months after the marriage, Long gets into a really serious motorcycle accident. And this is really important to connect with because he spends several months in hospital. And the most important recognition from Cynthia is that his personality completely changes. So he's had all these accidents in the past all these problems around attachment, feelings of abandonment, problems at school, issues with his body, so many head injuries. But now we have this relatively catastrophic one. And she notes that he becomes very, very different overnight. His sex drive increases when he gets out of hospital. It's a real problem. And also, he becomes really violent. And even though they have two children, and initially, let's be honest, their marriage was actually a really good one. Cynthia recalled they had a really happy life together. They had those two children together. They enjoyed their time together. But when he has that motorbike accident, from that moment onwards, Long just changes overnight. He becomes incredibly violent, incredibly controlling. He even tries to make Cynthia act and dress and do whatever he says whenever he said it. And this really high sex drive is causing them huge problems in their relationship. But just stop and think about that for a minute. This fixation, again, on the way that she looks. Is this the collateral damage of what went on within his relationship with his mother? Does he feel that a woman, if they look a certain way, are giving off a certain invitation? 
Has he broken it down to that black and white thinking? You are either good as a woman or you are bad as a woman. And so fundamentally tries to make Cynthia look, do and say things that he feels make her pivot into that position of being a good wife, not a bad wife, a good woman, not a bad woman a sexually available woman to a sexually humble woman. Humility. All these things I think would have been going on for long as he tries to control the uncontrollable. And now added to that, we have this really serious brain injury, undoubtedly transitioning his personality further. Cynthia actually recalls a particularly terrifying event with Long. One day he grabs her, he chokes her, he slams her head into the television, knocks her unconscious, and she ends up with a huge gash in her forehead. And when she comes to, she's on the couch, obviously she's been passed out, and he's there, he's crying, he's saying, I'll never do it again, I'm so sorry. But then the next words are, when you drive yourself to get your stitches, if you tell them what really happened, I'll kill you when you get home. So there you see this complete, dichotomy. On one hand he's sorry, he's apologising, and on the other momentarily he's telling her that if she tells anyone he'll kill her. And clearly knowing about Long's history and future, he's not lying. In 1980 Cynthia has had it up to her back teeth. She files for divorce, she wants out, she says that the relationship's become really toxic and violent and because of this Long moves out of the family home and in with a friend called Susan Replogel. This point is really important because we see a woman extending her offer of support, Long is allowed to move in with her and yet that woman within a year accuses him of raping her. Within a year. This woman who's offered him support, let him stay with her, is now a victim of rape, according to her. But of course, it was the 80s, the police said there wasn't enough evidence, you know, it's his word against hers. This was commonplace, it still is commonplace with respect, but it's better now than it was because we have a little bit more experience of forensics and we also have a much more sympathetic and empathetic view of rape victims. But believe me, in the 70s and 80s, the words, she was asking for it, were used not just by people who raped individuals, but by judges in court. Yes, judges in court would accuse women who were rape victims of dressing too sexily and seemingly wanting sex, even when they didn't. It's accounted for on numerous occasions. Even today, you will have the prosecution cross-examining the victim and accusing them of looking too sexy. Yet, misogyny is still alive and well in the courts in the Western world. Now, several weeks after Susan's claimed that Bobby has actually raped her, she then says he's pushed her down a set of stairs and she actually files a misdemeanor battery against Long. And it seems to be that we see a real escalation at this point. There is a transition of behavior in Bobby Long, from being violent, yes, abusive, yes, clearly raping women, because without a doubt, he will have been guilty, as Susan suggested he was. But there is an escalation in his behavior of violence towards women, because around this time, Bobby starts targeting and raping prostitutes around the Miami and Fort Lauderdale area. So he's going out now, and he's targeting prostitutes. I actually hate the word prostitute because what we're saying is women. I mean, we can call them sex workers, we can call them prostitutes. They're mothers, they're sisters, they're daughters, they're friends, they're human beings. And we do a lot to dehumanise victims when we call them prostitutes. And even if you're a prostitute or a sex worker and you're really proud of what you do and you're happy to use those words, you have to realise that for the general public, that can often be a way of dehumanising you and making the prostitute seem worth less than. And that's why serial killers go for sex workers. Because if you are worth less than, you are worth less than on every level, including the amount of investigative time that goes around resolving your case. Because there is this stereotype that if you are putting yourself at risk, 
then you are deserving of the potential outcomes. And it's ridiculous because a human being is worthy beyond measure. It doesn't matter what you're doing as long as you're not causing harm to another human being, you deserve respect and the same amount of time and investigation if you befall a crime. But even now, even today, we still see far higher issues of homicide within prostitution. Particularly in the modern day, if you are trans black prostitute, you are far more likely to be murdered. And yet we act as if somehow it goes with the territory. It doesn't go with the territory. It's just judgments and stereotypes are so prejudicial that people who lose their lives or who are raped end up in situations like that because people just simply don't value them in the way that they should be valued. And that's on us as a society and not them as a sex worker. Now, during this very chaotic time for Bobby Joe Long, he's also charged with an offence towards a child, a 12-year-old girl. He pleads no contest to sending obscene material to her, but unfortunately for him, they do use evidence in the phone calls that he's made to this girl because they can trace it back to his house. So we instantly see that he's becoming really, really predatory. You know, a 12-year-old girl he's sending obscene material to. That's deeply disturbing. And also shows that incredible lack of boundaries. I mean, what kind of damage can you do to a kid of that age? One of the problems that Long has is he struggles to stay in employment. He's hired at Huntington Veterans Administration Hospital in 1983. Gets fired. Why does he get fired? Because he acts really inappropriately with female patients. That's right, gets fired for inappropriately acting with vulnerable people. You can just see, can't you, that this is a really dangerous human being. What is he doing in hospital? You know, he's had all these allegations made against them, and yet, for whatever reason, he's still able to just walk into jobs in really, really vulnerable places. You can just look back now and imagine how much abuse happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s, because there just wasn't the collaboration of services. We still know that there are loads of predators who get away with things, but then it must have been a field day for them. Now, after Long is fired from his job, he gets another one temporarily at Humana Hospital in Brandon. But Susan Replogle comes back to haunt him because he's found guilty of battery against her and he's sentenced to probation. Now, Long disputes this because, of course, one of the things that we're going to find out about this man is he is so arrogant. Yes, he's had a serious head injury, and yes, that's caused issues with his personality, but it also seems to have amplified this arrogance. So he disputes it, and he's awarded a new trial. Now, what's staggering about Long is he's so arrogant that he can ask for this retrial, but he's obviously very convincing because he's acquitted of assault charges in the Replogley retrial. He's actually acquitted. And that will have bolstered his confidence so much. He's already arrogant. He's already got these impulse control issues. He's got a whole history of allegations against him, including from a 12-year-old child. And he gets off scot-free. What message is that giving him? And that's important because if you don't get consequences, if you can get away with it, then the chances are that you may just imagine that you're powerful beyond measure, that you're above the law. And if you have that mindset with a predilection to do harm, well, you've just been given a license to kill, haven't you? And in March that year, the year he's acquitted from that case, he commits his first premeditated rape. He basically looks at a newspaper ad in Newport Ritchie, sees this ad that says that this woman wants to sell a house. So he goes round, dressed smartly, pleasant, and when she gives him a tour of the house, he rapes her, steals all the valuables. Because what Long did, and he was clever, when he saw a house with a for sale sign in it, he would go up, he'd knock on the door. If a woman answered, Long would ask the woman if he could look around the house. And obviously, house is for sale. You want people to come and view it? Of course, chances are you're going to let that person in. Remember, this is in the days where women were often at home alone or with their children whilst their partners went to work. So she lets him in. And as soon as he gained entry, 
he would place his arm around the victim's neck. He'd put a gun to her temple. He'd walk her into the bedroom. And then he'd tie her hands behind her back, tape her mouth shut, which is terrifying. I mean, I am terrified of having my mouth covered. I feel really claustrophobic. But he would tape her mouth shut with rope and tape from his pocket. And then he'd rape her. And then usually he'd rob her, the jewellery that was there, and he'd go and pawn it because it would give him some extra money. It's terrifying to imagine the amount of premeditation that goes on in that situation. You know, having a rape kit in the car, thinking of a clever way to ensure that somebody's alone. Now Long is actually convicted of kidnapping, robbery and sexual battery for this crime. That's uh, 1985. And that really should have been the end, shouldn't it? That should have been the end of his reign of terror because this man has form, he is terrifying. He's had lots of allegations and now he's had a very sophisticated and manipulative rape. But this just does nothing to stop his behaviour. In fact, they believe that whilst Long was in the Florida area, he committed around 50 rapes. 50 rapes. 50 rapes. Now, it seems that rapes were not enough to satisfy Long. And like I said, when you're looking at 50 rapes in one area, you can extrapolate that to wherever he would have been because at a level of prolific action like that, you know that he's completely controllable. He's gonna be looking for sex anywhere and everywhere with whoever. You know, he dresses as an IBM man and goes and rapes a woman in her home. He knows that if there are places in the ads where it suggests that a woman is vulnerable, he can turn up, get into a home and overpower her. It's as simple as that. He's got it nailed down as far as his modus operandi is. He knows how to get to vulnerable women. They're not expecting it. You're not expecting a nicely dressed guy to turn up at your home, wanting to see your home. You're gonna think it's perfectly acceptable to let him in because you're not expecting that kind of attack. So he knows how to make women completely vulnerable and he knows how to have time to enjoy what he wants to do to her. Because that's the thing, when she's alone, he's got her all to himself but it clearly doesn't satisfy him. And on the 27th of March, 1984, Artist Wick, a prostitute, is picked up by Long. And after the sex, he doesn't feel that she's satisfied him. It's as simple as that, that's the reason. He doesn't feel satisfied by her, so he strangles her. Now this is where everything changes. Long goes from rapist and predator to killer. And he enjoys it. He really, really enjoys it. Less than a month later, Long actually tries to abduct a woman called Mary Hicks at gunpoint. She's driving her Jaguar and he gets in and threatens her. He's obviously thinking about killing her. And she's so bright, she's so clever, and she purposefully crashes her car. Now Long does have to pay damages and he gets three years probation for that. But wow. I mean, this is a man out of control. And what is happening that he's just getting probation? I mean, this is abducting a woman at gunpoint. How does he get to walk free? And why? And if that hadn't have happened, we would have seen a complete transition in his opportunity to actually commit these kind of crimes. Now, unbelievably, in spite of being on probation, and you would imagine that somebody would be at least tracking what he was getting up to, making sure that he stays away from women, but no. Because in May, Long rapes and murders Nguyen T. Long. Nguyen was a 20-year-old exotic dancer. And basically, he just drives up beside her as she's walking home one evening, offers her a lift, which the times are very different. People didn't want to be walking home if they could get in a nice warm car and she accepts. And Long drives her to this wooded area. He orders us to take off her clothes, ties her hand behind her back, rapes her. And then he removes her from the car and he strangles her to death with a bit of rope that he has in his car. And he just leaves her body on the road, naked. And they say that he spread her legs at like a really unnaturally wide angle but just to completely throw away a human life. I mean, what kind of a person feels that that's an acceptable thing to do with the body of somebody who would be loved by other people? Again, it says that for long, these women 
were just objects to be used and abused and that there was some enjoyment of what he was doing. And for the police, the discovery of Nguyen Thi Long, when the body is discovered, particularly in that form, I would imagine that the police did start to have alarm bells. You know, this is not a passion killing. It's not a execution. There is something more calculated about this. This is somebody who's enjoying murdering. Now, after the first body of Nguyen is discovered, others start turning up. Within a year, the body of Michelle Sims is discovered. She was a cocaine addict, she was a prostitute, and it turns out she was approached and picked up by Long as she walked along the Kennedy Boulevard in Tampa. Again, he has this MO, he forces her to undress, ties her hand behind her back, rapes her in his car, and he then attempts to strangle her, but she puts up a fight, she really does, and he responds to that by cutting her throat. Now her body is discovered with the rope still around her neck, she's got bloodied clothes nearby and one of the things that's discovered there, and this is really important, red fibres. Red fibres were found at the body decomposition site. That's really important to note. Those red fibres are very much the thing that changes this story. On the 8th of June 1984, Elizabeth Loudenback was murdered. She's offered a lift home when walking back in Tampa and after driving for a while, Long ties her up rapes her at gunpoint and then drives her to an orange grove in Brandon, Florida. He then unties her and tells her to put her clothes back on, but then decides that he's going to strangle her. You know, he might have let her live, but because she was crying, it annoyed him, so he decides that he'll strangle her. And he actually throws her body into some shrubs and then uses her card at an ATM. So it demonstrates just this lack of compassion, this absolute callousness in his behaviour. I mean, he just sees human beings, particularly female sex workers, as complete throwaway objects. Now, unbelievably, he actually gets a job at Tampa General Hospital at this point. So there's this strange Jacqueline Hyde character. There he is working at a hospital, whilst in the evening he murders sex workers. How does anyone hold that cognitive dissonance that way? It's shocking, isn't it? Now we know that again, the bodies are starting to stack up. So the police are aware that something is going on. There is something going wrong in this area that bodies are being found. But again, this is the time where there weren't a lot of units working together, where sex workers with respect, even by the authorities were more disposable than girls from good homes, shall we say. So there's a lot of prejudice really clouding what should have been a very formal and very concerned investigation. The next attack happens in September 1984. Long picks up Chanel Devon Williams, who works as a prostitute as she walks home. He beats her, he undresses her, ties her hand behind her back, drives towards Morris Bridge Road before stopping near a cattle ranch, and he rapes her. He then pulls her from his car and he tries to strangle her, but she struggles, she struggles, she fights for her life, but he just shoots her in the back of the head. And again, he just dumps her body. And as he drives away, he throws her clothes out of the car. He's not rigorous about the killings regarding forensic evidence. This guy doesn't seem to care whether he's seen, he doesn't seem to care whether he leaves any evidence, he's just interested in the kill. Or he's so convinced that sex workers are so irrelevant, so disposable, that he can just get away with it. And I do think that he had that arrogant nature where he believed that other people would feel the same towards these women as he did, because he clearly felt that they deserved very little. He clearly believed that they deserved the kind of treatment that they were getting. He was so delusional in his attitudes towards these women that he probably believed that others held the same views. Police actually discover Chanel Devon Williams' body on the same day that Long rapes and strangled Kimberly Hobbs, who's working as a prostitute. And you can just see that he's losing control at this point. Now, in October 1984, Long rapes and murders Karen Beth Drin's friend. Karen climbs into Long's car, offering sex in exchange for drug money. Long undresses her, bounds her, rapes her, and then he drives her to some orange groves where he strangles her and rapes her again. He leaves her body wrapped in a blanket under a tree. 
Now, a really important event happens on the 3rd of November, 1984, because Long kidnaps 17-year-old Lisa McVeigh as she's riding a bike home from work at a donut shop in Northern Tampa. Now, that means that she's not the typical victim, but for whatever reason, he chooses her. Like I said, he's got no control. At gunpoint, he forces her into the car, he blindfolds her, and then he takes her back to his apartment. And when he rapes her, he also starts talking to her in a way that makes her feel like he's trying to act like she's his girlfriend. And because she's been sexually abused before, so she's been interviewed and talked about the fact that she knew what sexual abuse was like and she knew how to deal with predators. She understands that she can't act afraid of him. So she tries to act like she's enjoying what's happening. She tries to talk to him calmly and kindly. And she just allows him and her to act and play along however is gonna make it so that she can survive. He then showers her, he dries her hair, he feeds her, and after 26 hours, 26 hours, he lets her go. He says that she can leave. So Long drops McVeigh off in a car parking lot, and about 4.30 a.m., she returns home and she tells her family, she tells her dad. They go to the police, they file a report, and the HCSO urged the Tampa Police Department to send their rape evidence to the FBI laboratory. And on the November 13th, 1984, the FBI laboratory called with the biggest break yet in the serial murder case. They found the same red fibres on McVeigh's clothes as had been found on the homicide victims. Even though the police now have some mounting evidence on Long, he's still murdering. And on the 10th of November, 1984, he kills Kimberly Swan. She's a new dancer. She accepts a ride from him whilst intoxicated. Now, interestingly, he doesn't rape her, but he just strangles her and dumps her body on the side of the highway. So again, what is that saying about the bit that matters? It's not the rape, is it? It's the extinction. It's the God complex. It's the knowing that he has complete control over the life and the death of his victim. And the thing about strangulation, I always say, it is so intimate. You have to be staring at them in the eyes on the whole, just to know that you are the person taking that last breath from their body. For us, that would be terrifying. We wouldn't want to kill. We'd do everything to protect. But for somebody like Long, it's absolutely intoxicating. It's what excites him, thrills him. He enjoys his work and he can't get enough of it. Maybe it's because he's always chasing that feeling of the first kill. It's never quite as good in your mind as it is in action. People are messier. People aren't quite as conducive to the images and ideas that you have so that you're always chasing that perfect vision that you can never quite achieve. In 1984, on the 15th of November, Long gets pulled over. He gets pulled over because Lisa McVeigh has spoken to the police very bravely and she's described the vehicle. And even though he's taken into police custody and he's photographed, he's released because for whatever reason, they can't link him at this point with any viable evidence. Obviously, we know that police surveillance was not how it is today. And at this point, we can note that they did start to surveil him at this point. They realised that he was worth being a notable suspect. When the body of Vicky M. Elliott is discovered in 1984, on the 16th of November, we see Long getting arrested. There's a warrant out for the abduction kidnapping and involuntary sexual battery of Lisa McVeigh and his official interrogation begins at which time he confesses to murdering at least eight women. Those red fibres are one of the most important parts that connect because most of the bodies that were found because he wasn't very judicious in the way that he disposed of the bodies and because that particular car had a particular type of red fabric it caused these small threads to be connected to the bodies or the things that he wrapped the bodies in. And that was what managed to create the real connection because pretty much all of those bodies had those fibers connected to them. When he appears in court in 1984, he is charged with eight counts of murder and sexual battery and nine counts of kidnapping. 
He's also charged with violating his probation from April 1984. And from this point, we see bodies being discovered. On the 28th of November 1984, the judge rules that a grand jury will hear Long's case. On the 5th of December 1984, Pasco County Circuit Judge determined that Long would stand trial for the murder of Virginia Johnson. We also know that Long is sent for a psychiatric evaluation the 11th of February 1985, that's when it begins, and he was classified as a sexual sadist. Dr John Money also documented that he had temporal lobe epilepsy that induced an altered state of consciousness, which is fair enough, he'd had really serious head injuries, but that's confusing to me, because when it says altered state of consciousness, you would almost imagine that what he's saying is there is a potential for the individual to not really be aware of some of the actions. Is that just an excuse? Is that a doctor merely stating that maybe Long wasn't in capacity during those killings? I would question that. I think he was very conscious. I think he was very calculated. I think he was very well planned in what he did. But nonetheless, that is what one professional believed. And Dr. Robert Berlin diagnosed Long with inherited bipolar or manic depressive psychosis and an organic personality syndrome caused by tissue to the brain. Again, fundamentally to do with the injury and also genetics being a part to play in that. So if they are all true, we had a whole heap of problems where Long is concerned psychologically. Now, Dr. Daniel J. Spray determined that Long had no mental illness or disease other than severe antisocial personality disorder. If you understand the court system, you'll often see that many different reports are written, some who are for the prosecution, some who are for the defense. The prosecution can often say that the individual has got no mental illness problems, no problems full stop, so they're fully culpable, fully guilty. And the defense will often have lots of classifications stating that their client was not in capacity when they carried out the particular antisocial behavior that they were involved in. So it does tend to be a battle like that. But I think we can all agree that where Long is concerned, there were some serious mental health issues potentially because of his frontal lobe damage. You know, he had a lot of head injuries. In 1985, Long is found guilty of the Newport Rishi rape case. And on the 22nd of April, 1985, the trial for the murder of Virginia Johnson begins. It takes the jury, how long? How long do you think? How long do you think it takes a jury to convict Long? Because remember, these things are really drawn out and often jurors can have to go away for long periods of time, sometimes a week. You know, it can be a real problem and then they get called back. So it's an arduous process. So have a guess. 40 minutes. That's how long it took them to convict him. That is how guilty Long is that they probably just had a sandwich and all went, yeah, totally guilty, knew that, day three. That's how obvious it was. On the 3rd of May, 1985, Long is formally sentenced to death by electrocution for the murder of Virginia Johnson. In the summer 1985, the assistant state attorney, Michael L. Benito, offers a plea bargain agreement to Long, which he accepted. The plea agreement acknowledged Long's guilt in the remaining murder cases, but shortened the lengthy trial process. The agreement was signed and Long was found guilty of another eight murders. Long later actually considered withdrawing the agreement, but he did decide against it eventually. And in July 1986, he was given the death sentence for the murder of Michelle Sims. Now, one of the things that Long managed to do really effectively was use the court processes and the trials and retrials and the appeals really successfully. Because if you think about in the UK, when we give a life sentence, you might get 12 years, you might get 17 years, but basically Long served over 30 years on death row, 30 extra years, because he made it so complex for them to actually put him to death. Now that takes some arrogance, doesn't it? That takes some clinging on to those opportunities to just wheedle out a little bit more time that as far as the courts are concerned and certainly the victim's families are concerned, you're not entitled to. But again, doesn't that just play into the kind of character we're dealing with? This is a man who killed without conscience, killed repeatedly, 
disregarded and threw women to the sides of roads after they'd been used, had no care or consideration for anything about them as human beings. He almost despised women. That's the feeling that you have to get when you think about this particular man. He despised them. And he was vicious and consistent. He had a clear modus operandi regarding the way that he selected women, the way he abused women, the way he killed women. This was a man who would have spent his entire life killing. And it took 30 years to get to a point where he met his maker. He died by lethal injection on the 23rd of May, 2019. That's right, 2019, three decades after he was found guilty for murdering those poor women. That's a strange system, isn't it? Where a man who carries out such heinous crimes somehow manages to get an extra 30 years of life paid for by people like you. But then, justice is a strange old thing, isn't it? And maybe it isn't even about what happens here. Because maybe when he took his last breath, he met a very unenviable creator, one that maybe won't treat him quite as well as the American justice system did. Long is a human being that is rare. He's a human being that I think we can all agree was both born and formed. His brain injuries, his experiences in early childhood, his insecurities, his rage towards his mother and the progressive feeling of antagonism and aggression towards women in general was something that was boiling for many, many years. And you have to ask yourself, when you look at the probation reports, when you hear about the crimes that he was accused of, why was nobody stepping in? Why did nobody stop this happening? Because his own wife feels guilty for not necessarily pulling the trigger that day. But actually, it's not on her to do that. It was on the authorities, who clearly had constant evidence that this man was a danger, to have stepped in and prevented him doing any more harm. But hopefully we've learned from these lessons, who knows? But bodies still turn up even now, even in this modern day where CCTV is everywhere and Big Brother really is watching you. Bodies still turn up. And from time to time, you can absolutely guarantee that there are killers living amongst us. Maybe even next door, because that's what they are. Wolves in sheep's clothing, effortlessly mingling throughout our world without us even realising. And sometimes when we do realise, it's too late. I think it's really important when I do this that we look at all different aspects that creates a killer. Because it isn't linear, it isn't straightforward, and we can learn from it. If we know that certain impacts in childhood or certain head injuries in adolescence can have this kind of impact, then we should be able to recognise early on the individuals that might fall into this kind of personality trait. And if we can do that, to some degree, we can manifest change. And let's be honest, when it comes down to serial killers, my God, we need to affect that change. If you've liked what you've seen today, please make sure that you subscribe. I really love seeing my new subscribers. I really appreciate you doing it. I will be back again to talk about another crime next week, same time, same place. Please make sure you join me. And also, I love reading your comments. Anything you'd like to add, let me know. And if you've got any cases that you'd like me to cover, I'll be doing it. Take care.